On the occasion corresponding to this, four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to take care of him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a long and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. This is a passage from Abraham Lincoln's brief second inaugural address on the front of the now finished U.S. Capitol on March 4th, 1865. This is Henry Wilson and the Civil War. As we covered last episode, Henry Wilson spent much of his time in late 1864 campaigning and working hard for Republican success in the election. Thanks to all that effort, Abe Lincoln was re-elected, this time with Andrew Johnson as his vice president. Though Wilson put the bulk of his focus on getting Lincoln re-elected, his seat in the Senate was also on the ballot. While Wilson was mostly popular with the people of Massachusetts, the Senate at this time was still not elected by the people, rather the state legislatures made the choice. While Wilson felt resolute in his position to be re-elected, challenges to his prospects were thrown his way. During the summer of 1864, Henry C. Wright, a passionate abolitionist author, tried to publish a pamphlet that sought to present Wilson as a dirty politician. Throughout their careers, Wright and Wilson had been friends at some points and foes at others. Wright had grown to prominence in 1859, following his militant speech in, funny enough, Natick, Massachusetts, titled The Natick Resolution. Wright's 1864 pamphlet sought to discredit and minimalize Wilson's anti-slavery work over the past four years. Wilson wrote in a letter, quote, No man has ever been and that wholly without a cause, so unjust to me as Mr. Wright. You know that I have not repaid his assaults upon me by neglecting to do an act of kindness to one of his sons. Now he is to come out with a pamphlet to strike at me who never wronged him. Well, so goes the world." End quote. While the pamphlet did very little to damage Wilson, his re-election hit other bumps in the road. John Andrew, the former Massachusetts governor, and a man Wilson had worked closely with had prospects for the seat. And so too did Benjamin Butler. Some in the Massachusetts Senate were weary of electing Wilson as they feared he was too ambitious for a cabinet position in the re-elected Lincoln administration. The Massachusetts Senate postponed the election, causing Wilson to worry his prospects were dwindling. Upon learning about the postponement, Wilson wrote, quote, the unexpected action of the Senate, I confess, surprises me." End quote. To ease some of the Senate's concerns, Wilson did his best to make it clear he had no ambitions beyond the U.S. Senate, though the Massachusetts Senate delay continued to cause him a great deal of stress. Wilson's friends recalled Wilson along with his wife Harriet, who had been ill, being greatly concerned about the Senate's dealings, even breaking into tears at some points during the deliberations. Some of Wilson's friends believed the delay was caused by Andrew's associates who were attempting to gain Andrew's leverage for a cabinet position. To clear up the complicated questions surrounding his intentions and move the election forward, Andrews issued a statement throwing his support behind Henry Wilson, writing, quote, In all events, I could not be a candidate against General Wilson. End quote. The air was cleared, and in the following days, the Senate moved to re-elect the Natick Shoemaker. Wilson once again affirmed his position of high power 
for the next six years. Six years that would be the most impactful in the history of the nation. Wilson saw the work that needed to be done to draw the war to a close and make a final push to secure the promise of equality for all Americans. The early months of 1865 carried great challenges to the Confederate Army's standing. Decimated by supply shortages and hurt by the destruction caused by General Sherman's destructive force through the South that continued through Georgia and through the Carolinas, many saw the South's prospects for victory dimming. The Confederacy was in great need of support and men, and the topic of arming enslaved people became more appealing to some of the South's leaders. For many years since the war began, many in the South had suggested that it may be effective in the war effort to arm enslaved men. Opposition ran deep to any notion of arming black enslaved men, even as their service became a lifeline. Despite harsh criticism, in January 1865, Robert E. Lee approved a proposal to enlist enslaved men to fight. Writing on the proposed change in policy, Howell Cobb, the President of the Provisional Congress of the Confederate States, wrote that using enslaved soldiers was, quote, the most pernicious idea that has ever been suggested since the war began. You cannot make soldiers of slaves or slaves of soldiers. The day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong." End quote. Toward the end of January in 1865, Jefferson Davis, the President of the Confederacy, began to consider the arming of black men as a last-ditch effort in having a chance at success, and in March, black men were approved to be armed. A reminder that while the Union did use black soldiers, thanks in part to the forceful push by Wilson, this was still a controversial act in the North, showing that while the North was far more racially progressive than the South, a deep and deadly culture of racism, oppression, and violence still prevailed. As the South continued to be disparaged, chances for military success seemed to fade. Jefferson Davis agreed to send delegates to a peace convention in the North, though in a final attempt for legitimacy, required a condition of the meeting be that President Lincoln recognize the Confederacy as independent, a request that the Union rejected, effectively ending the prospects for a peace convention. In the early days of April, the Union dealt the final blows against the Confederacy, finally capturing the Confederate capital of Richmond, driving rebel forces out. On April 7th, Confederate General Lee made a final push in the Overland Campaign, moving his 8,000 men towards Appomattox, Virginia. Lee hoped to find a weak band of Union men waiting for him, but what he found was just the opposite. General Grant had gotten south of Lee and trapped his forces. With very few paths for a successful escape and a disastrous Confederate loss at Appomattox, Lee knew the war was quickly coming to an end. Grant requested Lee surrender, but Lee refused, requesting instead a possibility to discuss a peace agreement. Grant denied Lee's last-ditch effort to make the loss less painful. On April 9th, Lee, knowing his forces were concerned and victory was impossible, finally agreed to discuss the terms of surrender. Grant had been struck with an awful headache the morning he intercepted Lee's message of surrender. Grant sent his staff officer, Orville Babcock, to inform Lee that he would meet him at whatever location Lee wanted. Babcock found Lee under a tree to inform him of Grant's message. Many onlookers thought that the similarly dressed Babcock was actually Grant himself, prompting the myth that Lee surrendered to Grant under an apple tree. Lee instructed his officer to find a space suitable for surrender, and Virginia native William McLean's home was chosen, and Grant arrived hours later. Grant felt a sense of awkwardness and uncomfort having to bring up surrender after arriving to Appomattox. Rather than jump into it, 
Grant procrastinated, trying to have small talk with Lee about the Mexican-American War, a war which they had both served in and knew each other from. Thinking about this meeting and the position these two men were in brings the bizarre nature of the Civil War into fruition. After hundreds of thousands of dead, two generals who had served with each other just years before now stood in a small and somewhat run-down home to discuss the terms of surrender. After the brief small talk by Grant, Lee requested they begin the business of their meeting. Grant presented Lee with the terms of surrender, terms that Lee found to be relieving. The terms promised to parole Confederate fighters so long as they did not take up arms again and allowed for the rebels to keep their side mounts and swords and act to avoid the humiliation associated with having to turn over your possessions. Lee's surrender was important as it symbolically ended the war, though in effect the Union still needed to capture the other Confederate forces to obtain their surrender. While the military activities of the Confederates began to dim, the Union still needed to achieve political surrender from the Confederates in political power. Following Lee's surrender, Union forces began to pursue Confederate President Jefferson Davis in order to capture him, a mission that was successfully done on May 10, 1865, a date many commemorate as the official end of the war, just one month after Lee's surrender at Appomattox. In the months leading to Confederate surrender, when the fate of the South was becoming clear, Wilson, Lincoln, and most other Northern politicians began to consider how the Union could be restored. Some believed that the South should be treated harshly for their traitorous actions. Others believed the best way to heal was to be gracious and welcoming to their Southern counterparts. Some felt the Union should be cautious of bringing these states back without making sure they would be loyal and not try to destroy the Union again. President Lincoln's reunion plan would require at least 10% of seceded states' populations take an oath of allegiance to the United States so they could be readmitted to the Union. Because Lincoln did not believe states could legally succeed from the start, he maintained a low threshold, as in his view, these states had never left the Union and were only in rebellion. Lincoln's plan required rebel states to elect delegates to rewrite their state constitutions barring some high-ranking political and military officials from participating in those discussions. Many Republicans, including Wilson, felt Wilson's 10% plan did not go far enough. In 1864, the newly forming Pro-Black Civil Rights Association of Radical Republicans in Congress passed the Wade-Davis Bill that called for at least 50% of a seceded state's population to swear an oath of allegiance to the Union for the state to be readmitted. The Wade-Davis Bill would also abolish slavery in the South and imprison anyone who attempted to stop the freedom of enslaved people. The bill also threatened to revoke any rebel citizenship if they continued to participate in rebel activities. The radical Republicans wanted to reshape the racist and oppressive society that the South had rested upon for a century, and they knew the only way to do that was through strong-armed tactics. While the Wade-Davis bill did pass Congress, President Lincoln vetoed it. It seems Wilson never had any resentful personal feelings towards his rebel counterparts and was generally a supporter of forgiving Confederates, though he did vote for the Wade-Davis bill. Wilson was supportive of letting Southerners somewhat off the hook, though he insisted that this would only be possible if they supported the extension of civil rights in the South. In the early months of 1864, Republicans in Congress pushed to pass a 13th Amendment to the Constitution, an amendment that would ban slavery. While Republicans in the Senate, including Wilson, were passionate about getting the amendment to the states for ratification, the House of Representatives held them up and rejected the amendment. With 1864 being an election year, albeit an important one, some congressmen and President Lincoln were hesitant to come out in favor of the anti-slavery amendment. Following the major Republican victories in November, 
By January 1865, Congress finally passed the long-awaited 13th Amendment, sending it to the states for ratification. Wilson said that the amendment abolishing slavery in the United States, quote, will obliterate the last lingering vestiges of the slave system, its chattelizing, degrading, and bloody codes, its dark, malignant, barbarizing spirit. Then the sacred rights of human nature, the hallowed family relations of husband and wife, parent and child, will be protected by the guardian spirit of that law, which makes sacred alike the proud homes and lowly cabins of freedom." End quote. Once ratified by the states, slavery was soon to be abolished in the United States because of the 13th Amendment. In celebration of the war coming to an end and their magnificent achievements for freedom, Wilson joined William Lloyd Garrison and many other national abolitionists and northern politicians in a ship expedition to Charleston, South Carolina, to visit the site where the war began four years earlier. Wilson and the other politicians attended a somber yet victorious commemoration at Fort Sumter, where the American flag was once again raised. The Champions of Freedom boarded their steamship and continued south to Florida. Wilson, socializing with his fellow passengers, was leisurely enjoying the beautiful ocean sunset when he was alerted that a telegram had been sent to his cabin. Wilson reappeared to the deck in a scramble to get the passengers' attention. Wilson shouted, Good God, the President is killed! Wilson, being the most high-ranking official aboard the ship, read the details of the telegram he had received, announcing President Lincoln's assassination. The ship immediately changed direction and headed back towards the north. A personal friend of both Wilson and Freedom, Lincoln's death reverberated through Wilson's thoughts. What was to come of national reunion? Who was to lead the nation? How will black Americans be treated? These are the questions that racked the slowly reuniting nation after the assassination of President Lincoln. In today's episode of Henry Wilson and the Civil War, we covered Wilson's re-election to the Senate, the results of the election of 1864, the closing of the war, Lee's surrender at Appomattox, and the varying political views of reunion. We also discussed the passage of the 13th Amendment, and we closed on the assassination of President Lincoln. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and check out henrywilsonhistory.com for more information on the life of Henry Wilson and to check out the new shop that was just opened on the website where you can make a donation or purchase Henry Wilson stickers. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send an email to henrywilsonpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I cannot wait to continue through the series of Henry Wilson and the Civil War.